Chapter 7, Ship of Death. The water which never stopped rocking, the small boat carried them swiftly to the side of the huge ship. As they got closer, she knew she had been right. It was a place of death. Amari could not see the top of it. It rested upon the great water like a beast, ready to swallow them all up. Two of the captives who had been yoked together grew hysterical as they approached the looming structure and leaped without warning into the sea. The slave woman gasped as one. Amari did not know the language of her captors, but she could tell they cursed as nets were cast overboard for the escaped slaves. Amari and the other prisoners in her boat watched, however, in horrified fascination as the two women, a mother and daughter, tried in vain to swim back to shore. The mother struggled to keep her daughter afloat, but the chains were heavy and they were weak from hunger and captivity. Suddenly, the mother disappeared from sight for a moment, only to reemerge screaming in agony. The ocean bled bright red. Two huge gray fish with fins of silver surfaced for just a moment, their backs gleaming in the sunlight. One of them clenched a brown arm in its teeth. Then both mother and daughter disappeared. Amari stared at the spot, waiting for them to reappear. They didn't. She had held her breath through the whole thing. She was so stunned she could not even pray. The sailors were now even angrier than before. The whip slashed across the backs of the remaining slaves once more, as if those still alive had to pay for the loss of the two who had died. No one else tried to jump. A rough plank had been rigged for them to climb from the small boat to the ship. It was narrow and shaky, but the sailors made sure the women had no opportunity to escape into the sea, should they dare. When she got to the deck, Amari stood amazed. It was like a small city made of wood. Poles taller than any tree reached to the sky. Loud, flapping pieces of cloth larger than a hut which were attached to the poles by ropes, some of which were thicker than her whole body. Barrels and boxes littered the area, and dozens of men ran around shouting at one another and clapping one another on the back. They were laughing and cheerful, but Amari noticed that everyone seemed to carry a weapon, a gun, a sword, a knife. Confused and frightened, she didn't know what to think. Amari had very little time to think anyway. A whip lashed across her shoulder as she gazed around the ship, and she was quickly jolted back to reality. She jumped and yelped at the sudden pain. She and the other women were herded to one side of the deck where a hole in the floor awaited. They were pushed into that hole and slid down into what Amari knew just had to be the underworld. She wished that she had breathed more of the fresh air on the deck and in the boat, for the air in this place seemed to have been sucked out and replaced with smells of sweat and vomit and urine. The male slaves had all been loaded before them, and she looked in disbelief at the sight before her. On narrow shelves made of wood, hundreds of naked men and boys lay chained together, wrists, necks, and legs held tightly by iron shackles. Only a few inches separated one man from the other. Each man had about six inches of headroom, not even enough to sit up. Under the upper level of boards, a second level had been constructed, and under that, a third. Each row of shelves held men, human beings, chained like animals and stacked like logs for the fire, row after row, shelf after shelf. The first row seemed to have more headroom and breathing area, but the second and third rows beneath them were already slimy with waste. The men on the bottom were splattered with the blood of the men who had been beaten, as well as the vomit and urine and feces that the men chained above them had no choice but to eliminate where they lay. A large rat ran across Amari's feet as they were marched past the men. She felt faint. Surely this could not be real. Some of the women cried out as they found a man they knew. Amari did not want to see Bessa tied like an animal. She turned her head and moved on. The area for the women was in a separate location. Their feet were locked in leg irons and had only the rough boards to lie upon. But Amari noticed that they had more room and that the air was a bit fresher. Not, nor were they stacked the way the men were. Amari was surprised to notice a number of children in their area. The men who had captured her group had killed all of the children. She had supposed because they were too much trouble to take care of. But the captives on the ship, as she found out later on the journey, came from all over Africa and by many different ways. Amari saw a small boy who huddled near his mother. He was about the same age as Quasi had been. She wished for a moment that he had lived so that she could hold him and comfort him. Then she shook the thought free. She would never want him to know these horrors. The ship of the death was surprisingly very much alive. It inhaled and exhaled the foul air of where they lay chained, and it rolled with rhythm of the water. Loud noises echoed down to them, pounding, clanging, and screeching and it seemed the white men were always shouting. She also heard laughter above. No one in the hidden, dark area beneath the ship laughed. All were silent in fear, with fear. Eventually, the activity above seemed to slow down. Amari felt a sense of anticipation as if something was about to happen. Perhaps it was night. 
She could not tell. Afi, still chained next to her, quietly began to hum an old Yui song. It was a laminate song at a funeral, a death song. She sang to the ancestors and to the other slaves. Gradually, even those not of that tribe joined in. Close to a hundred women softly sang with her. It was the saddest sound Amari had ever heard.